All right. Welcome in, everybody. We have some good laughs. Hopefully, we keep the momentum of the pre-show going during the show because, man, we got a guy on who's electric on and off the field. Curtis Byrne, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Thanks for having me. Man, absolutely, man. Baseball starts tomorrow. Like, I'm almost as stoked as you. I'm sure you're, you're more stoked. Obviously, you get to be on that field, play this game. But before we get into your story, before we talk all things TCU, man, let's break the ice, you know, Music's been a big topic of conversation post Super Bowl. We talked about the halftime show and everything. Who's your go to musician right now? If you're going to put somebody on that you're vibing with, man. So anything from Morgan Wallen, Riley Green, Luke Combs, all those guys. I like older country music too. So guys like George Strait, Alan Jackson. Uh, but yeah, for me, I'm anytime I put it on the radio, yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Anytime I'm in the car, throw on either the highway, they'll play some older country music and I'll tell you what. Alan Jackson, George Strait, unbelievable. I am not the biggest fan in the world of newer country, but since you went with those other guys, and I'll tell you, man, um, my parents took me to a concert that I, in real time, was not as appreciative about as I am now. When I was 14, they took me to Nashville for the George Strait Music Festival, and the headliners oh were George Strait and Alan Jackson. But at the time, had a young Kenny Chesney, Tim McGraw, Leanne Womack, uh, Dixie Chicks. Dude, this thing was stacked. Like, when you look back at it, like, every pre, uh, you know, what you know, opening act was a headliner later on. Like, it was wild that all these people played it the same. And then you have Alan Jackson and George Strait finishing it off. And like I said, at the in real time, I'll be honest with everybody on the show, like, I was more concerned with the fact that the ratio of women was like eight to one and I was 14 years old. So <laughs> music wasn't exactly my priority, but looking back, I'm like, I got to see the best of the best. Yeah, I know that's crazy. Especially throwing like Kenny Chesney, especially like how like he's left his mark on country music nowadays. Anytime like songs like don't blink. I mean, come on. That's unbelievable. Yeah, no doubt. And I love all the original artists. I'm not as big of a Morgan Wong. Guy. I tell you, I'll be honest with you. I got to kind of, I wasn't even part of it, but I kind of got a salty taste in my mouth. I was leaving the LSU Ole Miss baseball game when the people were lined up outside uh, the stadium to go see him at Ole Miss. And I saw how many people were dressed up. I saw how long that line was. And then for him to not play, like, I was like, man, I wasn't yeah. in that stadium and I'm pissed. Yeah, that, that sucks. Yeah, I, I got to see too. what I need to see. Travinsky hit a home run in the ninth for LSU to win. I know I wasn't worried about a concert. But <laughs> enough about that. Uh, let's talk about, you know, athletes that you like to watch, you know, professional athletes. Is there somebody, you know, it doesn't matter what sport it is. If they're on TV and you know about it, man, you'll turn them on and watch. Yeah. So for me, you know, there's two guys. So the one, the the big one for me, it's so I'm from St. Louis. So Yadier Molina, always growing up, me being a catcher, uh, just watching the way that he goes about his business, his leadership on and off the field. And another one. So I'm a huge Tom Brady guy. TB12. I love the way that he goes about his business too, in terms of, you know, team culture, championships, and, you know, how he was a teammate. You know, his story too. He was uh, kind of a, you know, late bloomer. And just the way that he took the NFL by storm, just, you know, kept working his butt off in the way that uh, his career all played out. So, yeah. Just love his mindset. So it's just awesome. Yeah. And the Yachty thing in this house, Yachty is the GOAT. We are Cardinals fans. It's my wife's favorite player ever. Um, my son, it's the first jersey ever owned, so you're going to win us over that. We actually, I have to send it to you afterward. One of the best, my wife's an artist. One of the best paintings she ever did was of Yadier Molina. Um, she ended up actually, it, she auctioned it at the Chris Hope uh, Foundation Gala, which goes towards pediatric uh, kids and cancer. And uh, it, I think it went for like 3500 um, but an awesome painting of Yachty. So you awesome. you win you win me over by saying that. Obviously, like you said, you're from the St. Louis area, so that's gonna happen. But he really he really is the goat. Like uh, my my dad, who's a Cardinals fan as well. Like he said, you know, it has nothing to do with him being a Cardinals fan. And you know, obviously, he's got 65 years under his belt, so he's got a lot more years than me. He said he's the best <laughs> he's ever seen. Oh, absolutely, yeah, best catch and throw guy the best defensive catcher there ever is in terms of handling a pitching staff and everything that comes along with it. He's, you know, he's, he's the goat. So 
we've we've been spoiled as Cardinals fans, Curtis man. Like this past year when we sucked, like I didn't really know how to handle it. Like we may not be winning World Series every year, but we're always you know fighting at the top of the Central at minimum at yeah. the, end of the year. And so to be last place and have Cubs fans trolling me, I didn't know what to do. Oh man, well that's the thing. We were you know really blessed. We had you know ten years with Pujols. Whenever he was hitting 330, averaging 330 with over 100 home runs or 100 RBIs and 30 home runs every year. And man, it's crazy. And then, yeah, last couple of years have been a little bit tough, but um, I think they're up on the uh, the uphill climb right now. So I think they'll be But fine. it's not supposed to be like that. We got Arenado and Goals. Uh, uh, you can't have yeah. two dudes like that and be that bad. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, those are two pretty all stars. And I know. Well, I, I'll <laughs> tell you, when the draft went by and being what we do here in Off the Bench and all you guys we interview and all the games I go to, you know, pitching is obviously what killed the Cardinals. And as I watched, like, a team like the Reds, right, go get Rhett Louder, um, go get Ty Floyd, go get Hunter Holland, like, all these guys that I've watched actively in college dominate, and here we are taking no pitchers in, in the first, like, five rounds, and I'm like, Dude, like, what are we doing? Like, I've watched all these guys go get one, and I'm watching Skeens go to Pittsburgh. Like, they're all going to, like, the NL Central. Yeah. Team, salt in the wound. <laughs> I'm like, Dude, for real, can we get one of these guys? Yeah. But I know yeah, I can talk I can talk Cardinals all day with you. We, we got to get your story. <laughs> I'm sure the uh, the TCU fans that don't like St. Louis are like, man, can these dudes move on? <laughs> but let's get into your story. You already said you're from St. Louis, so I don't got to ask that, you know. Um, yeah. Are you from like you know an outside small suburb of it? Are you actually from the actual city of St. Louis? Yeah, I'm about 20 minutes out of downtown St. Louis in a suburb. It's called Chesterfield, Missouri. It's uh, like I said, 20 minutes away. Um, yeah, it was awesome growing up there. Really cool environment. You know, lots of huge baseball and hockey fans uh, growing up. I mean. Back in the day, though, whenever we had the Rams until they went to L.A., huge Rams people, but they went to L.A. and that's all she wrote. But So being that you're a bigger hockey, guy, did you play hockey growing up by chance? A little bit, a little bit growing up. Um, I kind of had to make a decision just because with hockey and baseball, you got to kind of pick one. And I went with baseball. So, but no, hockey, it's, it's huge in St. Louis. It's like one of the biggest. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean – um, I'm told that I've been missing out, not going to Blues games more. I travel up to St. Louis all the time to go see the Cardinals. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, not the biggest hockey fan. They're like, it's different on TV. if you Or it's different in person than you see on TV. And my host says the same thing. He lives in Tampa, and he talks about going to the Lightning game. And he's like, bro, same thing. Like, TV does not do hockey justice, I'm told. if I, I'm told if I go in person, I'll feel completely different about it. Oh, it's unbelievable. I went to, I've been to a couple of uh, Blues games growing up, and you literally, you sit and watch, and you're like, what? It's just the pace of it. It's like quiet, but when they score, the place goes berserk. It's literally one of the coolest environments that you'll ever see. Yeah, I need to quit procrastinating and get on it. But uh, <laughs> talk about your family, you know, uh, mom, dad, brothers, sisters, what we got? Yeah, so I'm a one of five. Um, my dad, he's a, a construction builder, and my mom's a stay at home mom. So I have two other brothers and two sisters, and let's see, two of them play baseball at Drury University out in Springfield, and the other two, um, one's about to be in high school, and the other one's about to be in eighth grade. So, so are you are you the oldest of the five? I am the oldest, yeah. So what's that like growing up? Are you setting the example for them, or are you just kind of doing your own thing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'm really close to my brothers and sisters. So the cool thing about, you know, having a big family is that like going to baseball, football events, everything like that, going to practice, we're always doing something in the summer or just during the day. We're always outside doing stuff. You know, I built in teammates, my brothers. So it's cool. We'll always go hit together, you know, just go work out together. It was really cool just growing up like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm jealous because my sister was nine years older than me, basically by the time. I got old enough to really actively do anything, especially athletically, because she was an athlete. Um, she was already out of the house. So for you to be able to actively um, participate, do all those things, um, and obviously be a leader amongst them is is really cool opportunity that you got to have and something that you'll be able to carry on the rest of your life as you'll probably continue to be a mentor to them along the way. So, oh, man, good for you. And, um, you know, the, thank you. the family is an iron sharpens iron thing. But let's talk about, you know, uh, 
you talk about baseball area in St. Louis. What's the travel ball scene like? You know, who did you play for and what's the level of competition like in that area? Yeah, so um, in high school and middle school, I played for this organization called the St. Louis Pirates. Um, the owner is Rick Strickland. And, you know, it was really cool just being able to grow up really, really. There's, I mean, it's kind of crazy because the amount of baseball talent in St. Louis, like there's some dudes out there that it doesn't seem like, you know, kind of Midwest, but I'm telling you, there's a lot of really, really good players that come out of there. You know, guys like David Freeze, Ryan Howard, like Devin Williams, um, Luke Voigt came out of St. Louis and just the cream of baseball players. It's really, really good ball players. And you really wouldn't think that, especially being in the Midwest, but there's some really, really good talent out there. Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the – I keep telling you about the good things about this show, you know, interviewing guys from all over or girls, you know, depending on the sport and finding out how much talent comes out of a lot of areas. You know, being where I'm from in North Mississippi, most people don't realize it, but if you actually break it down per capita, um, you know, it's literally a top three in the country um, bringing out – ball baseball players like it's a lead obviously right down the street you know rock throwing distance uh, is the house that austin riley built um to set central but between wow. there and lewisburg which are only 10 miles apart if you just look around the sec and big 12 there are guys littered everywhere that came from these two schools over the last you know 10 years and so just a really great baseball area we got snowden grove right down the street which hosts the Little League World Series. So same thing in the Midwest, same thing we find out on the West Coast. You'll find out in North Carolina. You know, baseball is just, man, it's everywhere, and there's there's talent everywhere. And one of the interesting things, Curtis, that's why we find out a lot of guys um, go overlooked. Maybe they end up, you know, people don't like the transfer portal, but some guys don't necessarily get seen where they come from. Maybe they don't have the money, or maybe they don't necessarily get into a lot of showcases, and they'll end up yeah. at a JUCO or, you know, a real small school, and then people find out, oh, crap. You know, I'll give an exa obvious example. Ben Joyce ends up at a, at a juke, right? Yeah. Like, no clue that this kid's there. And then, hey, there's a kid that can throw 100 miles an hour playing juco <laughs> ball. Y'all want to go snatch him up? Like, it, it happens. And so, man, there's so much talent across the country. It can't all be seen. Um, but the Midwest, I have no doubt, especially, like you said, just, you know, Kids grow up wanting to be a St. Louis Cardinal. So you brought up David Freeze. That's just a magical story within itself. Um, yeah. But where did you go to high school exactly? Yeah, so I went to Christian Brothers High School in St. Louis. It's like – it's about 20 minutes away from downtown St. Louis. It's uh, It was a private school, all-boys school. There was about maybe a little under 1,000 kids that went there. What if I told you in Memphis, where I'm from, there's a Christian Brothers High School, all boys school, and it's elite as well. It's actually, oh I, yeah, I had to do like a double take when I read that and make sure that you weren't actually yeah. from Memphis. <laughs> yeah, no, the uh, it's all under the uh, De La Salle branch. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so you know, man, you play there. You're ranked as the the sixth ranked prospect in the the state of Missouri by Baseball America, you know, you're on the MHSBCA Class 5A first team All-State, um, you know, perfect game, National Player of the Year, all these accolades, right? Um, you know, I don't know if those necessarily mean a lot to you, but clearly you're on the national radar. How early did you start getting recruited? So, uh, kind of a long story, but my when I was 15 years old as a freshman in high school, I ended up committing to Indiana University. And they had a coaching change. So Chris Limonis, he ended up getting a job at Mississippi State. He went there, and then I decode uh, right after that. And then my junior year, I started getting recruited by TCU. So I got – Limonis left in – I think it was like 2018, 2017. And I committed to TCU probably about a week and a half later after I decommitted from Indiana my junior year. And that's how I ended up at TCU. Yeah, that's that actually is crazy and, you know, kind of tells the story of um, Lamonis as well for, you know, the Mississippi State people who don't maybe necessarily know the the route in which he came. But, yeah. you know, obviously you're getting recognized by high caliber schools and you have, you know, great options. You know, what about TCU, like, when you're lining it up, made it to be the school you wanted more than anywhere else? Yeah, for me, it comes down to the people 
And for, you know, TCU, it has unbelievable people, especially whenever I was on my visit and the, all the coaching staff, you know, Coach Sarlos, he did an unbelievable job showing me around, Coach Delora, they're all just awesome guys. And for me, that was really the biggest thing. It, it felt like a family there. You know, it was one of those things where I took my visit and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to go back to St. Louis and not commit. So I committed on the spot. And it was definitely, you know, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And I got really lucky and fortunate. I'm able to get the blessing to go play at TCU. Yeah. When we talk to you guys, it, it's always the same answer. It's got to have a family feel. You're going away from home. If you don't yeah. feel comfortable there, it's not going to be the place that a guy wants to go, no matter how talented the program may be. You, ha you have to feel good there. And so, you know, especially coming from St. Louis, going down to Fort Worth, so – Awesome. Speaks volumes to the the culture at TCU. So, you know, you get there and, man, you get there right when all the COVID crap happens, you know. Um, talk to a lot of you guys and, like, it really just throws off the whole process of, of, you know, getting your career started. So, you know, instead of, like, talking the negative, talk about just in that first year, even with all that, what you were able to take from getting acclimated, you know, into a top Big 12 program. Yeah, for me, I mean, I think it's – I tell, you know, freshmen this all the time. Your freshman year, it's by far your hardest year. And just getting used to being in college and just being used to the schedule of everything. You know, now COVID, of course, threw everything off a little bit. But the first couple weeks that I had getting used to a college season, I had my fall. I did my first fall. I had fall ball. Just getting used to the everyday grind of understanding what you need to show up to the field every day and exactly what you need to do to be successful. So I think for me, that was really the biggest thing, just getting acclimated to TCU and just like, you know, living on my own for, for the first time in my life. So, you know, from St. Louis, so it's about nine and a half hours away. And that's not, you know, close to home per se. So just learning how to live on my own, kind of grow up a little bit. You know, that's really been the biggest thing my freshman year was really the positives that I took out of it. Yeah, no, I mean, it's all about what you take, even – um, talking to guys who redshirt, right? Like you have to maximize what you take in, and, you know, it's getting acclimated to the environment. It's getting acclimated to the weight room. Um, you know, you obviously, you're still growing at that age. It's about, you know, developing, you know, academically. It's about getting used to the classroom. All these things you can take from, like you said, being a college freshman, even with COVID and everything, there's still so much you can take in. And like you said, you're telling young guys that um, because it is a transition, man. It, it is a life change. You know, you got to, you got to kind of grow up fast. Um, yeah. so you get into that next year, you know, you still only, you know, play 16 games, you know, still getting your feet wet. Um, you did, however, you know, you had a 333 batting average, 471 on base percentage. Um, obviously you get brought in for defensive replacement too, which that's one of those things I never, uh, undervalue guys that can be brought in for defense speaks volumes because it's who they trust at the end of the game to make sure, um, you can close the thing down. So making that next year getting, you know, getting your feet more wet, obviously developing more, having a solid batting average, being that guy defensively. Talk about that year. Yeah, so I was behind. I was really fortunate. So another positive thing, you know, my sort of my redshirt freshman year, I guess your COVID year, I was behind a senior catcher. His name was Zach Humphreys. And that was really one of the biggest blessings that I had in my life was I was able to pick his brain and learn about, you know, how he goes about his business, what he does on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, that was really good in terms of my learning curve because it just shortened the curve. Whenever I'm watching a guy, you know, he's one of the all-time greats at TCU, just pick his brain about stuff. And I couldn't have been luckier about that. And, you know, of course, like you were saying, like get my feet more and more wet, understanding the game, understand why you, you know, do certain things, you know, picking coaches' brains, just trying to figure out why they do certain things during the game. And for me, that was really huge in terms of just listening. You know, not just being, I mean, it's always good to be thrown to the fire, but, you know, for me, sometimes it's good just to sit back and listen and always be ready. But at the same time, you're a sponge at that age and you need to learn exactly what they're doing and why they're doing certain things. Absolutely. And so you take that knowledge and then you go into 2022 and it all comes together, right? You get 55 starts, um, you know, 52 of those are behind, you know, the dish, which you know, being a catcher for elite level pitching, um, you've got to be able to communicate with your staff, know them very well. Um, you know, being the catcher is the, to me, the most important position in the game of baseball. Um, you know, being an LSU guy, I'm always down there talking to Alex Malazzo. I'm watching him, watching him communicate with his pitchers, worked with them, getting to know them, understand them. 
um, because it's the key to, you know, the success within the game. And so for you, now that you're getting 52 games, and like I said, with an elite TCU pitching staff, just talk about, you know, that bond, that connection, um, you know, starting from the fall all the way throughout the season, how you were able to to develop the way you were and be able to um, catch those guys. Yeah, for me, it all starts in the fall whenever you get, you know, you have to learn your pitchers and their tendencies, like what guys you have to talk to in certain situations, what guys you kind of jump. But for me, it was really cool just to see all of that come together in the spring because all the things that worked on the fall, it all came to fruition in the spring. And just going through, you know, my first really college season playing every day, getting used to, you know, how to take care of your body, you know, how to, you know, feel you know, as close to 100% every day, you know, getting the cold tub, getting treatment. And for me, just being able to just learn about, you know, each pitcher and their personality, that was the biggest thing for me. Because, I mean, all pitchers are different and they're all, you know, they got a little screw loose, but <laughs> you have to learn exactly how to you know, navigate each guy. And, you know, during the spring catching 52 games or whatever it was, it was just cool just to, you know, I had that workload for my body and it was, you know, felt really, really good at the end of the season. And I ended up catching more games, played several that summer, went into Cape Cod and finished out, caught, I think it was like another 30 games and my body felt really good. So that was just showed like it was a testament to, you know, my body being healthy and, you know, doing the treatments, doing everything I needed to get ready to play. Yeah. And let me talk about what you did, you know, hitting. Obviously, we talk about what you're doing catching. I, I love stats like this. It, it really, man, people don't really understand. You had a base hit in 40 of the 55 games and got on base, you reached safely 47. Like, that, man, that's a testament to the time and the work that you put in. You know, the way you're seeing the ball in a game of failure to reach base 47 out of 55 to get a hit in 40 out of 55 – Clearly, that speaks. You're talking about in the fall. In the fall, you talk about in the summer, the work that you're putting in. You know, just talk about you know uh, how you felt about your plate success, and you know, like I said, being able to successfully hit the way you did. Yeah. So for me, it was more. I mean, I didn't really hit for you know crazy power that year, but I think I only had maybe five home runs. But in terms of just learning how to navigate a college season, hitting and like getting my routine all down and understanding what I need to do to get ready for a ball game. Um, that was really the biggest thing for me. It was all about being as short as possible and just working through the middle of the field and not worrying about, you know, exactly what the guy on the mound is doing, just playing to my strengths where I handle the ball really well. And I think for me that really came to fruition again with all the cage work I did and all the success led to it. Yeah, and so that comes into this year, which we're going to break more into the actual team, was really getting y'all individually. We're going to talk, you know, this past season, this upcoming season um, team, but, you know, you talked about for you individually didn't have as much power, but this past season um, you obviously did. You had, you know, 10 bombs, um, you know, nine doubles. You had, once again, I mean, it's outrageous. Your your OBP, um, you know, I'm sure your batting average, you would have liked to have had it better. It was only 285. Um, but, man, you were really a staple. You had, you know, 50 appearances on the season as well. You know, obviously you had a lot more as the DH. What happened, um, you know, that transitioned you to be more in a, more of a DH than that staple behind the plate? Yeah, so for me, I had a back injury midway through the year to where I was out for probably, I think it was about four weeks, five weeks. And I had like a lower back. I just had like a back spasm and I was a little bit banged up during the year. I got healthy and they wanted to really protect me and make sure that I was healthy throughout the rest of the year. So they put me in the DH spot and I would catch just some spot starts just so I was healthy enough to be able to hit. So that was really the biggest thing, the biggest transition. Yeah, so I get to see you guys. I am at Globe Life Field covering the college baseball showdown. I'm actually sitting in a suite with Jalen Battles and some of the Arkansas parents when we watch y'all absolutely take Arkansas to the woodshed. I said I was going to be nice when I talked about it. I lied. Um, And the reason I don't mind saying it is because I brought up Jalen Battles for a reason. He sat there and talked about, man, this TCU team is so damn good. Like, and I get it was early in the season, but obviously, you know, it was a foreshadowing of later in the season, not just Arkansas, but as a whole of how good this team was. Um, talk about, you know, for the team, not just you yourself, but for the team, you know, those those early season matchups against top teams 
obviously help get you ready for conference play, but it also really gives you a, um, you know, a gauge of being able to find out how good you are. And so when you go into a globe life and you play in a pro stadium like that and you handle a team as good as Arkansas, you know, how are y'all feeling as a team? Yeah, you know, we felt really good, especially going into it. You know, we, our first game was against Vanderbilt, and everyone had the juices going, really excited, especially opening up in a big league ballpark. Um, you know, it was awesome, of course, beat Vanderbilt, beat Arkansas. Um, you know, you got to feel good about it, but, you know, I think we ended up losing the next game to Mizzou. But uh, for us, we, you know, it was a good first weekend, but we knew we had to, you know, be in the present moment and not look forward to anybody or anything that we're doing. And, like, especially don't get too high or too low because, you know, ex exactly whenever you get too high on a win or, you know, too low on a loss, that's going to you know, be devastating to your ball club. And I think for us, the biggest thing was just focusing on staying in the middle and in the present moment and not getting too high or too low. Yeah, and I think y'all did that throughout the season, right? You know, um, kind of had an up and down season. There were there were flashes of this team is is brilliant. They're an Omaha team. There were you know sometimes like I don't know. There's some question marks. Obviously, it's a war of attrition. Y'all battle injuries throughout the season, but when it all comes said and done, you got to go to Fayetteville for the regional, and we had Trey Richardson um, on right after, and you know obviously he he uh. He claims that it was his Denny, his Denny's breakfast that led to his three bombs. But, uh, you know, obviously, y'all take care of business. And like I said, it was a foreshadowing. Like, we had seen this movie before. Um, and clearly, y'all weren't scared. You know, Arkansas is such a hard place to play. It is – but if you talk to to guys, I mean, I think most would say it's Bomb Walker is a top five difficult spot to, to play in. And yet, y'all handled your business, um, you know – how good does it feel to go into a, you know, a top seed like that into their house, handle business. And, um, you know, what ends up being, you get to go to supers in your house because of circumstances. Yeah, definitely. I think Trey was eating uh, IHOP too. Uh, That's what it was. I said, Denny, was IHOP. IHOP. you know, he got that commercial, uh, or he got that, uh, advertisement. <laughs> he should have, he said, I don't awesome. know why I was thinking Denny's, but he said, <laughs> no, he, he said couldn't. he had two plates too, man. He, he said, it stacked. yeah, he went, backside two grand salamis so that was that was awesome but i told austin no, davis was, in his episode he clearly you know because i messed with him because he didn't have nearly the series i said you didn't eat enough <laughs> uh that's another great oh my gosh that guy's oh uh, man this is the best but no it was uh you know of course you know the regional all shaped out we you know saw the selection show so we're going to fayetteville everyone got really excited just because you know it's a one of the best environments in college baseball to go play at i mean it we showed up and we're like, wow, this is awesome. Like really cool place to go play. You know, they're, you know, y'all's fans or their fans are unbelievable. They let you have it, which is, you love to hear it though, you know, mm. especially being an opposing team. You just love hearing that stuff. Just to, it's a, you know, what else do you want to go play for? Like, that's what makes it fun. Just hearing guys, you know, just screaming. Yeah, you no, they're stuff like they're that. loud there. Cause you said, y'all, I'm an LSU fan. Alex box. Uh, that's what I thought, yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to say, but like in comparison, bomb Walker is definitely louder. Like, you know, they try to, they, they compare those top sec stadiums. I definitely will give bomb Walker the nod Their Their fans are louder. And it has kind of a, uh, been what, you know, I thought it was best when uh, Doug Nikhazy and Taylor Broadway came on here and we're talking about, and they said it kind of has a Fenway Park feel to it. And, uh, you know, obviously not yeah. really as big, but the green seating, the way it's widespread like that, uh, very nice ballpark. Absolutely. Especially in the, you know, the hog pen and left or it's just, that place is awesome. It's just the environment, everything about it. It's, uh, it was really cool. I mean, just being able to, we jumped to a, you know, early lead in the first inning and just to hear that place just, just quiet. You know, that's a, that's a cool feeling, especially as a team. It's just that, you know, silence the crowd and kind of, you know, get into it. So um, really good feeling, especially. And then we ended up winning it, winning the regional, and then, you know, being able to host Super Regional back at TCU against Indiana State was a really cool feeling. Yeah, and I mean, you know, they have a reason to feel that way. Like, you feel good as an Arkansas fan, not just being at home, but you got Hagen Smith on the mound. You just don't expect um, that to happen. That didn't happen to him all season, and so – they were they were definitely like shell shocked, but um, obviously you advance, and then you know the circumstances happen with Indiana State, which yep. you know shout out to them for for hosting you know the Special Olympics and doing what they did. I'm actually glad it went to Fort Worth. You know I make a lot of jokes, but the whole cemetery behind the left field wall at Indiana State is just a little too weird for me. 
Um, yeah. I, I don't know, man. Like, uh, they say Texas has one out, like, by the stadium. But I know that I actively can't see it during the game. That was so crazy as I was sitting there watching that regional. Um, and I was like, oh, my God, there's, like, literally – graves right behind you can see the the headstones and i was like I, i'm so glad this thing's going yeah i'm not hurt. yeah that's a little, <laughs> little scary i'm not gonna, uh yeah but you know y'all end up sitting the that was the thing right when we talk about the grow of the game movement when we talk about fan bases there were some people that obviously were salty that y'all got to host but when you host and then you have record attendance that's ultimately what you want in the game of baseball um, and so TCU fans show up, show out, y'all show up and show out, book your ticket to Omaha. What's that feeling? You know, as a kid, that's what every kid dreams of. Obviously, national championship is what you want at the end of the day, but it all starts with Omaha. So what was it like, you know, for you and the guys when you punched that ticket? Absolutely. You know, the feeling of just being able to go to Omaha in terms of, you know, you worked your whole life to win a national championship, but just going to Omaha, you know, awesome experience to got. You know, I went to Omaha a couple times when I was younger, watching TCU, actually, from like 14 to 17. So it was already, you know, my dream school. So I was, you know, especially being like 15, 16 years old and just going to watch them. Yeah, that was one of the coolest experiences. And then, you know, being able to go play in Omaha as a TCU Horn Frog, that was even cooler, which, you know, unbelievable feeling. Just being there, you know, feeling the dirt, just seeing what it actually looks like on the field, you know, playing there in front of, you know, whatever, 20,000 people awesome experience and you know it was just and just winning it at tcu with the super regional awesome awesome feeling especially with our teammates and my brothers just unbelievable yeah no doubt and um you know when it comes i've been to omaha the last three years covering it and when you look at that field like i can say that of the of the three seasons the eight teams that were there um, you know, because a lot of people, you know, they weren't believers in in like oil robbers, but, it, you know, the eight teams were there were probably as stacked as I've seen. When you look at, you know, Florida on the all side, right, and then, man, on the other side, good grief. Like, yeah. Stan when Stanford is your worst team of the four, like, are you kidding me? Like, and so, man, it was, it was just crazy how much talent was in Omaha, and it was one of those things where you felt good in the sense of, even me as an LSU fan, right, like, I felt like somebody who deserved to win – was going to win, like no matter what way it felt on. If we would have lost to Wake Forest, for instance, you know, hey man, they're legit. Um, I hate Florida, but if we lost to them, they're they're legit. So, um, y'all were part of one of the best fields, you know, I've seen. But you know, coming into this season, there are the same expectations. Y'all have now. You're no longer, even though you didn't win a championship, um, you're now not the hunter. You're the hunted. Like, um, you're the top of the Big Twelve. You're a team that everyone expects to be in Omaha. You're going to be playing, you know, at Globe Life again with uh, big opportunities. So talk about those expectations, how you as a leader of this team, how you are handling, hey, let's take it a game at a time. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. We know the talent we have here, but we can't just make any assumptions. Yeah, absolutely. I think you said it really well. You know, I think the biggest thing for us is just worry about, you know, the present moment. You know, it sounds cliche, but – you know, hearing all that outside noise, just block it out and just, you know, play every day, like you're, you know, the worst team in the country, you know? And I think having that mindset of playing, you know, having the confidence that you're the best team in the country, but having the mindset of, you know, you got a chip on your shoulder about it. That's what's really going to be the separator, I think, this year is, you know, focusing on just ourselves as a team, focus on the 40 guys we have in the locker room and don't worry about all the expectations and stuff that we have on us. Because that's really, that's going to, all that stuff's you know, awesome to have, all the accolades and stuff. But, you know, the game's played on the field. And all that stuff goes out the window between the lines. So just worrying about how we take it day by day in the present moment, I think that's what's going to be the biggest separator. Yeah, no doubt. And so let's talk about you personally first. You know, you talked about your back. Um, you know, how are we feeling right now? Are you 100% healthy? Will we see you behind the dish regularly? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I got, I worked out this summer with our strength guy, uh, Zach Dakin, and he got me feeling really well. Um, so I'll be between I'll catch and play first base. I think that's the plan right now. So it'll be good. Nice. And so let's talk about the pitchers that you're getting to work with. Um, you know, for those who maybe don't know, you know, they should know, but talk about some of those elite arms that you're getting to work with. Yeah. So we picked up a guy to the transfer portal by the name of Peyton Tully. Really, really good stuff. He's a two-way player. Um, you know, he hits balls 450 feet and throws fuzz in the mound. So it's always a good guy to have on your team. 
Um, another guy, you know, Ben Abel, Cole Klecker, guys that we had from last year, you know, Luis Rodriguez, you know, really, really key arms. We have picked up a guy from Arkansas, actually, Zach Morris. Really, really good stuff. Um, just being able to have guys like that on your team makes it, you know, just that much better. You know, we have another guy like Kyle Ayer, really good stuff. Um, transfer from Houston. Unbelievable, you know, really good fastball, really good secondary pitches. And just, you know, learning how to navigate all those guys and talk to them and learn their pitch sequences and their types, you know, makes it really good. It's good good to have those guys in our club. Yeah, one guy I'm going to miss, uh, we had on here multiple times, Luke Savage, uh, huge, yeah. huge fan of his, uh, man. Uh, I'm excited to see what he does with the uh, Rangers organization. Um, he's a guy that definitely, you know, it's going to be a tough place because – um, man, he could come in. I remember going all the way back to, you know, talking about Globe Life. He was big in that um, opening weekend, but he's a guy that could come in in a big time situation, get you out of a gym, even eat up some innings uh, if need be, if a starter can't um, go very far into a game. So um, I'm excited to see this pitching staff and what they do. When we talk about hitters, you know, and talking about guests again, you know, I just mentioned them a little bit ago. Obviously, you lose guys like Richardson and Austin Davis. Talk to me about the guys in the lineup around you. Um, I know Shot and Ye, who I've watched a lot here in Ole Miss, um, you know, is a guy who moved there. I know he's got a glove. I know he can be a top of the yeah. order. Um, talk to me about the rest of the guys. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Shot and Ye, of course, coming in from Ole Miss, hell of a player. Um, shortstop, you know, Anthony Silva, awesome player as well. You know, we have – I think the good thing about this club is we have, you know, just so many position guys that you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, guys like we got a freshman, his name is, you know, Ryder Robinson, really good stuff. Really, really good player. Um, veteran guy too, Luke Boyer is out in the outfield. Awesome player. You know, our freshman class that we got is really good. And also bringing back a lot of veteran leadership is going to help out a lot. Um, guys like, you know, Sam Myers is a freshman too, is an outfielder, really, really good player. You know, Carson Bowen, awesome player behind the dish. Um, you know, Guys like Logan Maxwell can really swing it and uh, Chase Brunson. So that's really exciting. Yeah, no doubt. And so the uh, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll play a game, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out, you know, I want to go to as many places as I can. I want to support as many guests as I can. And, you know, I wanted to make it to Fort Worth, but it doesn't really fall down. But I think I'm going to head out to the dish and watch you guys against Texas you know, obviously there's, and I bring that up because there's high expectations on Texas as well. Um, you know, how excited are you for that particular series? You know, when you look at the fact that Texas is fixing to leave, you know, for the SEC, this is the last year where, you know, you get to have an epic showdown with them. You get to have it in their house and what may be, you know, the battle for the best team in the Big 12. Yeah, you know, uh, played it. Texas two years ago and their environment, it's one of the best in college baseball, I'll put it up there with any of them. And, you know, really good ball club coming back. And it's very exciting that uh, we get to go there and play, you know, really good club. And uh, it's going to be awesome, especially with them leaving for the SEC. You know, it's going to be one of the last times. So it's, uh, it's really cool just being able to go there and play them again. And, you know, really excited. You know, we're not looking forward to, you know, any games per se, just because we got to worry about what we have, you know, today, tomorrow, and just focusing on the current moment and not, you know, looking forward to any series because, you know, our schedule, anybody can come out and beat you. So just being ready for that. Yeah, no doubt. We had, uh, we had, uh, freaking Lane Forsyth. I was mind blowing. I'm going to interview somebody else. Uh, Lane Forsyth that night from Oklahoma State. And, uh, he was talking about how good they look. So I just bring that up to say, you know, Oklahoma State, just another good team that you're talking about. You yeah. really can't, you can't overlook anybody. And man, I'll tell you what I didn't know, Curtis. Man, I seen their locker room, and I messaged him, and I was like, are you kidding me? Here I am. I, me and my son have toured, like, all the SEC uh, locker rooms and fields and whatever, and I've been, like, dead set on, like, the SEC has everything better. Um, I told Lane he went from, you know, what looked like the best place in Duty Noble um, with, you know, how much money they have poured in there to – I'm looking, I'm like, man, did you, like, get to – call the two best places home because I saw the <laughs> renovations there and I was like, man, you've been living large. <laughs> you know, that I, didn't place realize, is, I didn't realize they had it's it. It's like awesome. That. Yeah, it's crazy. We played there again two years ago and the ball flies there. It's like a, the just the, the stadium. It's stupid. You just walk in. I didn't even see the locker room, but um, I think I've seen pictures and stuff, but I didn't actually go in to see it, but just the stadium, the layout's awesome. You know, the cages, the whole nine yards. It's a really, really cool place. All the facilities are awesome. Yeah, these these stadiums for 
um, the Big 12 and the SEC specifically because I have been to some ACC and they, you know it's not throwing shade. They're not the same, but yeah, the way the way it's done in in the South and in the Midwest is just uh, it's different. But let's get into a game. It's called this or that. You get two options. You choose one or the other. Can't say neither. Can't say both. You down to play? Yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. This is brought to you by Chinook Cedary. You get eight flavors, mild to wild, the best season in the game. I know you've had them because y'all have ambassadors. What is your favorite flavor? I'm going to go with, uh, I said ranch. It's back to back episodes. I'm, I am not a jalapeno guy. So that the jalapeno ranch is not my deal, but I know it is highly popular. Um, you were actually, we were talking about it. You were on with Alex Day on the hot corner. That is the, the flavor he stands by as well. That's the beauty of the eight flavors, right? There is a flavor for everyone. Like if you don't like a certain thing, there's going to be some of us. I mean, they have cinnamon toast. Like if you're like a yeah, sweet, come like on. candy type person, like man, go for it. Like, yeah, absolutely. Here we go. Simple question out the gate. Chicken or beef tacos? Beef tacos. Have to. All right. Liquid or bar soap? Hmm. Bar. I like bar soap. Yeah. That is back-to-back bar soaps. I and, like that. And Daniel is not here. See, Daniel claims liquid soap is better. I claims bar. It's why we have this question. It's an odd argument. But I told him like I don't have anything factual. I actually lie to guests all the time if they say liquid and I'll tell them that um did you know that statistically it only cleans 50% of your hands and they're like really and I'm like no nah, I made that up. But <laughs> but I'm convinced like cuz it just runs off your hands. Like it don't clean like a bar of soap does. So we managed to make this a question and a thing where we argue. So Daniel's one way, I'm the other. But you said bar, that's back to back. That's what's up. Yeah, we're in. All right. <laughs> What do you like better, the purple uniforms or the icy white uniforms? Oh, man. I'm going to say probably the all whites. I like the all whites. I just like the feeling of, you know, you hit a double or you hit a triple and you slide it head first and you come up and you're just all dirty. And, you know, it's come on. Yeah, every it's every baseball like like mom's that. nightmare. <laughs> you literally, yeah, you got to throw out all the stuff, yeah, all the cleaner. Good luck. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, that, it's a good thing that, you know, they, they got professional stuff to do it. But I, I think back to when my son played baseball. Yeah, you always, my wife, when the when the uniform required white pants, it was like, ah, oh, uh, man, no. no. <laughs> All right, speaking of wearing things, would you rather go to a costume party or a pool party? Pool party. Yeah, me too, no doubt. But if you were yeah, to party. go to a costume party, what are you going as? White Goodman from Dodgeball. You, you that guy's knew, a classic. You knew right off the top. I love that. Like, <laughs> I feel it. We, uh, we, we started this question because we were messing with Josh Hartle because the Wake Forest guys won his Teletubbies, and we just find that so strange. And so they said they like costumes and costume parties. And so every every question we add, uh, we ask, there's a reason behind it. Anyway, uh, and so that started that. Teletubbies is unique for me, but I can definitely get down with some dodgeball. I actually ran in a 5K last year um, where they had uh, guys who dressed up like Global Gym and, um, <laughs> and what you call it? Uh, what's that gun? The name of the uh, actual good guys? Average, average, average shows. shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As average oh, shows. And I was like, because it was a <laughs> Halloween themed um 5k and so when i saw that i was like okay i just want to go home now because i didn't dress i didn't dress the part i was uh i was actually <laughs> part of the tune squad i didn't i didn't look as good as they did oh uh, that's funny <laughs> all right would you rather be lost in a jungle or trapped in a haunted house oh man see like right here either way there's there's problems you know if you're in the jungle you got to deal with you know tigers Puma snakes, like the whole deal. And then you're a haunted house. You got to deal with ghosts and stuff. So, yeah, this, this question <sighs> used to be, would you rather get in a fight with a grizzly bear or a tiger? And so to your oh, point, yeah. it's a, it's a no win question. It's basically which yeah. one would you rather deal with? I think I'd rather deal with the jungle. I yeah, said the haunted yeah. house just for the, the very first thing that you said, um, a tiger at night in the jungle, just sound oh, no fun. Like... Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't choose right there. You, you know, you're screwed either way. But the next guy, see, I transitioned that perfect because then the next question, there, there is no losing. So would you rather have a private yacht or a private jet? Private jet, for sure. 
Yeah, it's all about if you're a water person or, you know, if you're somebody yeah. who just likes to to get around from here to there quick. And, you know, I, I'm somebody, I was in the Navy, so I picked it for a reason. I love being on the water. I'm somebody who would want a, a yacht, but, you know, a jet to, hey, you can get to Europe in no Anywhere. time. Yeah, Literally, so. yeah. Absolutely. All right. Last one, money question, the biggest question we always ask, would you rather be the number one overall pick? So basically comes with a $10 million sign-in bonus or win a national championship. Easy, win a national championship. Yeah, I used to think it wasn't easy. I used to argue but, the money, but after Paul Skeens actually came on here and said that he would give uh, the first pick and the money back, I really have no argument for a guy who actually did it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, too, it's it's all about winning. So, I mean, it's, that's really the biggest thing. And, and it. it's not the hardware, right? It's, you know, you we we talk to guys all the time that come on here who's won, or especially like pros and Joes, like I told you, we have the minor league guys. You know, the ring is sitting somewhere in their room at their old house or, you know, like Dylan DeLucia, he said his most outstanding, you know, player of the College World Series is in a box in his mom's garage. Like, it's not about the hardware. It's about the memories of you and your boys through the yep. whole season. And, and we talked about Omaha getting it done on the biggest stage. Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about the teammates and the relationships that you have. That's what it's all about, which, yeah, that makes it, yeah, to your point, that's exactly why. Absolutely. So, Obviously, off the hot seat, is there anything you want to plug or promote? Do you have any NIL deals, any nonprofit things, or, you know, just social media you want to share so people can follow you? Yeah, so my uh, Instagram handle, it's Curtis-Burn4, and I think it's my Twitter as well. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's been a pleasure. Um, that's Curtis Byrne, everybody. If you like hearing his story or you just like hearing Average Joe's talk X's and O's, please like and share the podcast on Facebook. Retweet us on Twitter. Listen and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and Anchor. As always, ratings, comment, hug, love, feedback, all that good stuff is welcome. We will see everyone back. I think I want to do, Curtis, I think I'm going to do like 20 shows today. I don't even know who's next at this point. I, <laughs> I've, I've been lost. Baseball's tomorrow. I'm so excited. I just want to interview yeah. everybody in the country. So, uh, you yep. know, with that, man, strong body, sharp minds, grit and grind all the time. We are out.